The fantastic work that the Nash boys are doing with their Urban Banks theme and some of the trendy adverts they have. They're very street, they're very urban, they're very off the wall. And it's just turned car fishing on its head because it shows that you don't have to be clicky in a syndicate to go out and catch fish. But more importantly than that, enjoy yourself. And if you look at the faces on these lads when they're out doing what they're doing, it is clearly an enjoyable pastime. But anyway, once again, enough from me because the moment is here. Let's have on stage the Urban Banks himself, Mr. Alan Blair. Thank you, Mary. The stage is yours. Hello, everyone. All good? Yeah. <laughs> the girls are still chasing Jason, but will he need replacing after round two? If he's not Mr. Right, turn off your light. I've always wanted to be on that stage with my name and lights, Jason. I'm now part of a local Andram group. When girls find out, some will be like, oh, that's not very macho. <laughs> It's nothing more I like than a little bit of night fishing with my best mate Steve. My mate Jason would be a great catch for any girl because he would treat you like a real princess. Steve, I've got one mate! So, good morning, ladies and gents. Uh, firstly, thanks, thanks very much for all coming and listening to my talk, and, and thanks to, to Carping On and Angling Publications for giving me the opportunity to get up here and have a chat with you guys. So, yeah, a bit of a strange intro to, to my talk. That, that clip was taken from a TV series uh, actually on tonight called Take Me Out. Um, I'm not proclaiming you should go home and watch it tonight, but I can hold my hands up. I have seen it a couple of times myself. And, and as you saw, you know, the concept's pretty simple. There's 20 girls and, and one geezer gets the opportunity to go on a date with them. There's a series of tasks and uh, in one of the tasks, the lads get to say a few words about the, 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 the lad in question. And they mentioned that he liked night fishing and we all saw quickly the reaction that the girls had. They thought it was terrible and boring. And as a result, all of them hit their red lights. Well, actually, I think fishing isn't actually like that. And, you know, it can be exciting and interesting. And, and I'm here today just to tell you, you know, a bit about the urban fishing that I'm doing. Um, I suppose it's, it's right and proper to start way back when, you know, when I was in school. And frankly speaking, things weren't very different. I remember in my class, nobody went fishing. In fact, in my whole year group, nobody went fishing. And they used to say to me, it's boring. Why do you want to go fishing? But I've always done it and I've always loved it. So, you know, looking right back to then, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up in a small village, you know, the sort, rolling countryside, little stream running through the middle of it, loads of places to build dens, etc. But only a stone's throw away was Milton Keynes. Uh, Milton Keynes, you know, it gained city status in 1967. Um, I wouldn't really say it's famous for anything, but it had this radical grid design uh, and lots of roundabouts. But what it also had was a lot of fishing available to me. Um, you know, big, big gravel pits, balancing lakes, the River Ouse, the Grand Union Canal. It was all on my doorstep and I had plenty to go at. Um, yes, throughout the summer holidays, etc., etc., I would go and find beautiful secluded spots, you know, tuck myself out of the way and, and really enjoy myself, my own little havens. Um, but that said, I also learned very quickly that you could go fishing in these urban environments. And I spent many, many sessions fishing the likes of Wolverton Mill, Thursden, uh, the River, the Grand Union Canal, etc. 
those sort of early memories, you know, back then you had the close season, so there was a momentous build-up for June the 16th to come round. You know, the few friends that did go fishing, we'd all get prepared, get everything together, and uh, make a, an annual trip down to B&Q to borrow one of their trolleys, because back then I didn't have a barrow. And off we'd set on, on the many redways, down the underpasses, to eventually arrive at our, our chosen spot. Some of the sessions would go really well, others not so well as maybe we, we weren't allowed to be there or not allowed to night fish because we were, we were unaccompanied minors. But any, anyway, they were the sort of early days of me, me going out urban fishing. Um, as well as sort of, you know, doing this fishing, I also went to school bang in the centre of Milton Keynes. Although I lived in this village on the outskirts, I went to school in the city, and that in turn brought another dimension. I had to get the bus in, and it meant I could sort of bring a rod with me. Uh, my mother also worked in the city, so I'd have a rod in her car and stuff, and it meant I could go after school, have a few, few quick evening sessions and catch a few fish. And those sort of early sessions, although I never caught any monster carp back then, it was a good grounding, and I remember most of them, and there were significant captures even to this day. I don't think I'd ever have called myself as a carp angler, far from it. I was just an angler, but I understood carp. I understood their environment and what they like doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And as a result of that, I did catch my fair share of fish. Anyway, fast forward 15 years. I'm now in a very lucky position to be in front of all you guys. Uh, I've got an amazing job. I work for Nash Tackle. And this job takes me all over the world. Um, but nothing's really changed, guys. You know, I can still remember, remember my roots, and I'm still out there urban fishing. Yes, of course, I am in a lucky position where I can fish some real exclusive syndicates, some special private lakes. But more often than not, personally, I choose not to. Instead, going and fishing an urban, an urban location. I think one of the main reasons for this is, because I've got such limited time, fishing a busy day to get water or a pressured syndicate, you're always up against it, not only against the fish, but of course the other anglers. And if I choose to fish a more quiet urban spot, I can do my own thing. I make my own rules, you know, and I, and I usually really enjoy myself. As I mentioned, through work, I travel all over the length and the breadth of country and, and right into Europe, be it for meetings, shows, uh, shop days, etc. And, and when I'm going on these, uh, these sort of work trips, I have got the opportunity to stay in hotels. And, you know, as much as a fillet steak and a glass of red wine does sound appealing sometimes, more often than not, I'm on the bank somewhere, albeit for a few hours or, or a quick overnighter. I suppose whenever I'm going to attack an urban session like this, the first port of call is local knowledge. You know, I'm speaking to whoever I'm going to see. Is there a canal close by? Is there a little park lake? Is there somewhere I can jump onto for the night with a chance of catching a fish or two? So yeah, a bit of local knowledge of what's in the area. Other than that, when I arrive, you know, the, the usual rules apply, guys. It's a simple case of I'm looking for big bridges, any sort of structures in the water, duck feeding areas where loads of bait's getting put in, uh, big marinas, wider areas, you know, the general sort of things that might be a magnet to hold carp. Tactics are real simple. Like I said, a lot of it's very, very short sessions, quick overnighters. The old scope concepts really come into its own with this. You know, I travel nice and light, keep things to a minimum, and keep things nice and simple. Strong, reliable rigs. I won't leave home without some amber strawberries or some white chocolate boilies. Basically, anything that's white, because those fish in that type of environment instantly associate the colour white with food, just because of the sheer amount of bread that they're getting fed on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, other sorts of things that are usually quite essential, a pod, just because of the nature of the ground you're fishing over, and I've always got a snag leader with me just in case I am fishing up against obstacles. But other than that, guys, they're carp. You know, it doesn't matter where you're fishing for them, carp are carp, and the usual sort of rules apply. Just in the last few weeks alone, to give you an example of how passionate I am about this style of fishing, I've been over to France for a show, done some urban fishing, been to Holland, did some urban fishing, just quick sessions here and there. Uh, I shot up to Birmingham to visit the uh, Fosters of Birmingham and do a shop day, and I actually popped into Broad Street, you know, which is bang in the centre of Birmingham on a Friday night, took a lure rod with me, caught some awesome perch, and it was just a real cool evening, you know, as much as I was bang in the centre of Birmingham, it was really quite quite beautiful, you know, there was all these purple lights and it was, it was just a mad thing to do and I really enjoyed it. And just in the last few days, what with the close of the river season, uh, I've been down on a local stretch near me. I actually had a lad called Pete from Advanced Carp due to, to come up and see me earlier on in the week and uh, he wanted to drop on somewhere for the night. Now Pete's similar to me, he's a bit of a lad, loves his fishing and uh, as much as I could have probably spoke to Nashi and said, Kev, can he jump on church late for the night or I could have put him onto one of my syndicate waters, I said to Pete, fancy doing a little bit on an urban spot? He said straight away yes, and he did. He jumped on there for the night. I went to see him in the morning and blow me down. He'd had a couple, including, you know, this is the picture, a nice one, just under 23 pounds. A lot of these spots would be ignored. You know, I went back the two nights after, ended up catching six fish to just under 20 pounds again. 
and uh, I took a young lad with me who's never even done any river fishing before and he actually had three 20s in, in literally just two or three hours. And it just goes to show lads, you know, don't ignore everything. It, it might not be your usual cup of tea, but odds are on that there's going to be some carp about. Moving on, Urban Banks itself. Um, I've got to tell you guys, at no point did we sort of sit around a table and say, right, let's come up with this concept. We'll, we'll call it Urban Banks. And what you do, Alan, is you go fishing in these urban environments. We'll pick somewhere with loads of graffiti, stick a five panel on, we'll stick a bit of dubstep music over the top and we'll create this, this series. It weren't like that. It just, it's just organically and naturally happened just because it's the type of fishing I'm doing anyway. Anyway, I suppose I'm going to quickly run through a series of chapters, starting off with chapter one, which was shot on the Grand Union Canal. Check this out and then I'll talk a little bit more. So yeah, chapter one. Um, it shouldn't really have ever been in Urban Banks, but it is, uh, and, and it's worth me mentioning it as, as a result of that. Basically, I was out on you know any other sort of canal fishing session with, a good, with my good mate Matt, and uh, Rich Wilby, who was working for us at the time as our journalist and photographer, he come along to shoot a mag feature. Um, before leaving, Winston, the legend that is, said to him, look, do us a favor, Rich, while you're there, try and get a little bit of video footage. So yeah, that's exactly what happened. We went fishing for a few hours on the canal, shot a little mag feature, shot a little bit of video footage, and Rich took the footage back to Winston. And for whatever reason in the edit suite, Winston decided just to put this little urban spin on it. We launched it up on YouTube and almost instantly, yeah, we got a great response. People were saying, oh, I love this, you know, this urban fishing. We'd love to see a little bit more urban fishing like this. So, you know, like the old, the old saying, got to give the crowd what they want. We did exactly that and we went on to create tra chapter two. Chapter 2 was shot down at a local park lake to me, Rochford, and again, I'll just show you the quick intro before I chat a little bit more about it. What a lush day, I'm off to the park. Most towns and cities have them. Built as a point of recreation for people living in the area. You know, dog walkers, cyclists, bird watchers, families coming down to feed the birds, utes at night, tramps, that sort of thing. But there's one thing they've all got in common, water, lakes. Today I'm down at Rochford Park in Essex. I've got 24 hours on my hand and I'm gonna go and try and catch some fish. Yep, so that's Rochford. It's a park lake really close to where I live and work, which is really convenient. It allows me to keep a little bit of bait trickling in and I flit in and out of there from time to time. A few hours here, an overnight area in there. This particular session, I was going down to do an overnighter. Again, nothing planned. I just said to Winston, look, bruv, do you fancy coming down? We'll shoot a little piece. So he popped down, done a little intro, bust around the lake, looked at a few lightly looking spots and he left me for the, in the evening uh, with the plan of coming back in the morning if I caught a few. He left me a little Canon video camera and said, look Al, do us a favour, if you catch any, just record it. Typical me, absolutely dreadful with technology. I've gone and caught myself a couple of little commons and uh, recorded them, or so I thought, until the morning when I was all excited, like, yeah, I've got some win, I've got it on film. He's like, bruv, you only impressed start. And I, I totally messed it up. Anyway, luckily enough, I did have two or three other fish. And when, when, when Winston arrived, I had a couple of nice fish in the net. Interestingly enough, um, I actually lost a couple of fish that morning. I was fishing to the right hand side of an island and uh, just fishing a simple choddy, flicking a few baits over the top and uh, I dropped the fish just on a hook pull and I actually got cut off. I was later to find out that there's a big sort of tree that had fallen down there. Uh, there must have been some mussels or something on it but I ended up getting cut off. Anyway, you can see in this photo, a few hours later I'm up a tree and uh, 
although it was sort of early spring, it was a really nice day, and due to the nature of a lot of park lakes, they tend to be quite shallow. Couple that with the fact there's a lot of bread going in, the fish are always quite receptive to a floater. Anyway, I found this group of fish, I'm flicking a few mixers out, and they're just lethargically coming up, taking a single mixer at a time. When Blow Me Down, one of the better commons has come up, took a mixer and nailed in the bottom lip was my chod rig. It done the lead or everything, just the chod rig sitting in its mouth. I'm fumbling quickly to try and get a dog biscuit on and, and try and catch this fish, but it just went meant to, be, meant to be that day, you know. But it was interesting to see just how quickly after, you know, going through the, 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 the agony of maybe being played, battled, etc., etc., that straight away they were back on the munch again. Yeah, Rochford was a, was a really cool day, and it was, it was chapter two, like I said. Um, and I thank any of you guys sitting here today. If you have watched it, it's had an amazing view figure of over 160,000 now. So, yeah, thanks very much for watching it, if you have done. Moving on, uh, chapter three saw us venture down to, to a tidal river. Um, and again, just have a quick look at the intro, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. today, Tidal Rivers, check this out. You're probably thinking what a ridiculous location, but I'm here for one reason, to catch a carp. So yeah, chapter three, Tidal Rivers. It was around this time that sadly Rich Wilby left Nash Tackle to go and work on his own venture, uh, Airfield Lakes, the home of the amazing Wood Common, uh, which meant we needed to fill his role. And there was only ever really one candidate, and that is Ollie Davis, O to the D. He's at the back there filming for us now. Um, we took Ollie on as our journalist and photographer, but around that time, Winston, myself, Kevin, we all started to really understand the importance of this videography, the power of YouTube. So one of Ollie's briefs when he did start working for us was as well as going out and getting mag features, he was gonna have to go and get a bit of video footage too. Uh, he'd never done any of this before uh, and Winston soon beat it out of him and it wasn't long before Ollie was out there capturing the moment with the best of them. Anyway, the particular session in question, I said to the lads, come down, I'm fishing this little tidal river. Um, actually, I'll tell you a little story about this first. This particular little tidal river, when I moved to Essex from Milton Keynes about six and a half, seven years ago, it was the first ever place I did an overnighter. And the story goes something like this. Me and my pal Reedy, we both wanted to go on an overnighter. I said to Basie, Gal, do you know anywhere locally we can just shoot on, do a quick night, catch a few fish? And he said with a smile on his face, lads, I've got the perfect place for you. It's only down the road, lovely little bit of river. You can fish underneath a bridge and there's loads of carp there. And we're like, yes, Gary, thank you so much, mate. Really, really grateful that he passed on this information to us. What he forgot to tell us, though, was that the river was tidal, and he insisted that we set up underneath this particular bridge. Now, if any of you know Gary, he is a proper prankster, and he royally stitched us up, because at one o'clock that morning, we woke up to literally the water about to brim over the top of our bed chairs. All our rods, bite lines were completely submerged underneath the river. It was only because I was using those butt locks that my rods hadn't drifted off down the river. We packed up, went home, went into work the next morning, and, and he was so proud of himself. He was absolutely made up that he stitched us up, and we got flooded in on this particular river. Anyway, Reedy vowed he would never ever go back there again and he never did. Me, however, I, I, I believed him that there was carp there and I did go back time and time again and caught some lovely fish. So anyway, back to the plot. I said to the boys, come down to this little spot, you know, there's a chance we can get a few bites. Another interesting story, actually, while I was there, I found this gun. It was a semi-automatic shotgun and uh, it might, there might be nothing in this at all, yeah, but literally two minutes up the road is where the Retterdon Land Rover murders were, a real famous sort of Essex boy murders, and the guns from those murders were never recovered. Now, this particular spot I'm fishing is bang on a busy road. I'm not suggesting this, but there is a slight possibility that maybe someone sort of drove by there and dumped this gun off the bridge. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm deviating too much. The particular session, it was very, very short. We only did a few hours fishing, and uh, I blanked. Now, a lot of people would have canned the footage and said, now, write it off, that was a disaster. We didn't. The three of us sort of sat there and thought, nah, 
this is part of fishing, blanking, and I, just like all of us, do my fair share of blanking, guys. So we decided to run with a piece anyway. However, every cloud has a silver lining, and, and Turner up the back there, he just become editor of Crafty Carper magazine. He got in touch with us and said, I'd love a series of articles for the magazine on this urban carp fishing, you know, and of course we obliged. Um, the article, the first article we were going to do was over at a park lake in, in Basildon called Northlands Park. And I, I really don't understand how this never clocked in my mind. But the morning in question, I was ex so excited to go fishing at this park lake, I hadn't comprehended that even though I had to defrost my car with a real thick layer of ice and drive in there, avoiding patches of ice on the road, that actually when I arrived, the lake might be frozen over. And yeah, you guessed it, it was. There was a lid completely on it. And I just stood there like, what an idiot. Of course it was going to be frozen. I was just so excited. Anyway, I quickly rung off, I said, look, bruv, it's off, cancelled, we'll do it another day. And I drove back to work really frustrated. You know when you've got your heart set on getting the rods out and then for whatever reason you can't? It was one of those situations. I said to her, look, uh, sorry, I drove back to work and I thought, rather than going back to work really frustrated, I'll try and get it out of my system and I'll stop off at the little tidal river. And even though I'd blanked before, you know, there was always a chance I could get a bite. Anyway, very quickly, I started trickling maggots down the river, dropped the rod on the spot, and almost instantly it's hooped over and I'm into a fish. It wasn't just any fish, it was an incredibly beautiful little mirror. Got the rod back out again, bang, straight away it's gone again. Another fish in the net. Basically, in 20 minutes, I've got three fish in the net. So another quick phone call to Ollie. He shot down and we shot the piece. So encapsulated in the moment that we kind of both let ourselves down a little bit here and we forgot to film it, didn't we, bro? <laughs> got the pictures but forgot to film any of it. Anyway, that was sort of chapter three wrapped up. And, and if you haven't seen it, uh, it'd be nice, guys, just check it out, just to see that little piece of river. You know, it just shows how unique creatures carp are and how they can survive and thrive in, in the most unlikely of places. Moving on, we're now on to chapter four. Uh, and chapter four did actually see us going back to Northlands to get the, the mag feature for James. Again, check the intro out and I'll chat a little bit afterwards. So yeah, there you have it. That was the intro to Northlands. Basically, I arrived at the water with Ollie. Uh, the plan was, basically, Northlands split into two sides. There's a brick wall sort of dividing up the two, the two lakes. We'll call it the harder side and the easier side. The plan was I was going to jump onto the harder side and try and catch one of the better fish. There's a, there's a half decent stock of 20 pounders in there, so that was the plan. However, just before Ollie left, this real big band of cold air come in and almost instantly everything turned white. And uh, typical me, I decided that rather risking a blank, I'd go on the easier side because I just like getting bites. Anyway, Ollie left me and he planned to come back the next morning if I'd caught. And the night went really, really well, guys. I had one, then two, then three. And before I knew it, morning had come around and I had seven bites in February. It was a right result. Um, and the day just got better from there. Bearing in mind it was the middle of February, you wouldn't believe how hot it was on that particular day. So much so that people were actually eating ice creams. It was half term, the park was very, very busy, and it just made for an excellent day. By far the greatest piece we've done so far. Um, all in all, I caught 18 fish in less than sort of 24 hours. 
a remarkable day's fishing anyway, but what made it really, really interesting was that the stock in the lake is predominantly mirrors. Now, when the bailiffs come down to see me, they'd ask me how I've been getting on, etc. I said, yeah, I've had this, this, this. They're all commons. They said, that's it's impossible. You know, it's mainly mirrors in the lake. Uh, like I said, by the end of the day, 16 commas and only two mirrors. And it just goes to show you, uh, a lot of people say that commons are a hardier fish than mirrors and they wake up a lot earlier in spring. And for sure, that, that complete sort of coat of, of golden scales definitely does make them hardier. And it was proven when I caught so many commons in a lake where there, quite frankly, isn't that many. The day in question wasn't only great because I caught so many fish. What made it really, really special was just the sheer number of people that were there. People were coming over and saying hi. There was lots of people that had never even seen a carp before. We were engaging with society. We were getting everyone involved. People were catching fish and it really, really did make it special. And, and for me, that's all part of this. A lot of people would probably shy away from that, you know, maybe rather ignore it and get on with their own fishing. But I welcome it with open arms. I, I love the banter. I love getting on with people. I've always been quite fascinated by people, you know, a bit of people watching. I'm looking out here now wondering what he does, where are they going after this? You know, what, what do people do every day? And uh, there's no greater place to do this than in, in the middle of a busy park lake. You know, people are coming together, be it to go cycling, jogging, running, walking the dog, um, maybe getting their lunch out of a bin, uh, or in the case of anglers, getting the fishing rods out. You know, people are coming to this one communal place and it's a great place to interact and engage with people. Yeah, for sure it was the best one so far. I absolutely love doing it and, you know, this really does sum up the, the whole ethos behind Urban Banks. And that kind of uh, uh, leads us on to, to the fifth sort of chapter that, that we filmed in the last couple of years in the UK, and that is Stratford-upon-Avon. By now, a lot of people were getting in touch, you know, showing the love, saying how great they thought the stuff we were doing was. Uh, and I was getting lots of people saying, oh, you should come to my spot, come and have a look at this little urban spot. If you're one of those people, I'd apologise now for not being able to come and visit. I'm just so restricted on time. Maybe one day I will get there, but... Um, yeah, I'll let you see the little intro and explain a little bit more about Stratford-upon-Avon. Today I'm down on the canal at Stratford-upon-Avon, the home of William Shakespeare. Sadly, I'm not here to visit him today, nor to look at any of his memorials, museums, etc. I'm here to go carp fishing. Yeah, basically I was on my way back from Manchester, I'd attended a show and I was coming back down the, through the country and I decided to stop off there. Lewis Baldwin, a friend, had mentioned that he'd had some nice fish out of this particular canal and I just stopped off to have a look and do a quick overnighter. When I arrived there was about sort of six, eight inches of snow on the ground. It certainly didn't look good for a bite but typical me, I thought I'd give it a go anyway. Set up in the snow, never saw a soul, um, yeah, and needless to say I blanked. <laughs> but again, it's all part of fishing, you know, I was there, I was trying. Anyway, the next morning I didn't waste an opportunity. I had a real good walk up and down the stretch looking for any likely looking spots with a plan of getting back in a few weeks time and giving it a go. Anyway, a few weeks later we did go back, Winston, Ollie and myself, and um, yeah, we nearly wrote it off guys. We stood in this car park here now where this pay and display sign is and uh, we're basically gonna knock it on the head. It did not look good. The, the weather was very cold. It didn't look good for, for a buy and they had that much expensive camera equipment. It just wouldn't stop raining and uh, it was potentially not a great idea to get this equipment out in such, a, such dreadful weather. But, you know, after a bit of a, a morale lifting talk in the car park and a quick bacon sandwich, we all manned up and decided we're here. Let's give it a go. And off we set. Uh, this particular session I brought a push bike with me just because it is a long, long stretch of canal and I wanted to quickly cover a lot of ground, trickling a bit of bait into likely looking spots. The session itself, we started off in a marina, um, but we were quickly asked to leave, even though that there was absolutely no signs anywhere to say that you're not supposed to be there. And I suppose that's part and parcel of this urban fishing, you know. Um, 
I don't intentionally go and fish places, not all the time, that I'm not supposed to be anyway, but um, it's just about being polite, you know, if you do find yourself in this situation, the guys asked us to leave and we quickly moved on and went about our fishing elsewhere. So off we set up through the canal in Stratford, just looking for lightly looking spots. Like I said, it didn't look good for a bite, but just worked really, really hard at it. And I eventually came across a group of fish sort of stacked up in some rushes, managed to nick one off the surface on a bit of bread, and uh, also caught a second fish later on that afternoon on a little solid PVA bag. You know, these little bags are a great method for short session fishing, guys. You can be so well prepared, have a load of them tied up, and when an opportunity arises, just loop another one in, cast it out, and away you go. Yeah, it was a great example of a day when, frankly speaking, the three of us wanted to go home, didn't want to do it, it didn't look good, but we manned up, went out there, uh, and the end result was we got another piece. And that kind of wraps up the sort of five chapters within the UK. But uh, I've got to mention now, you know, the whole, the whole European thing. Um, I personally have been massively inspired over the years by what the lads over on the continent are doing. There's guys out there also doing their urban fishing. I'm going to show you a quick video now for some really good friends, Bastel and Nick. Uh, they're from Austria and they fish a, a lot of areas in and around Vienna. Anyway, check this out and we'll have a little, little chat about the whole European scene. So yeah, as I said, there's loads of guys over on the continent, various places in, places in Europe doing their thing. And you know, I've made some great friends over the last few years. Uh, people like Mark Droner from Carpzilla in Germany, uh, Jerome and Julien from France, uh, Bastel and Nick obviously from, from Austria, uh, Mikhail and Mark from, from over in the Benelux, Giovanni from Monkey Climber. There's lads out there doing their own urban fishing, creating their own sick comment, content and creating their own awesome videos. So it was obviously a natural progression that we would take the, the whole Urban Banks concept over into Europe, you know, enter Eurobanks. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this one, but it, it got launched quite recently, and again, it's been very, very well received. Um, yeah, it, you'll see a little, a little trailer for it in a minute. It, it was a mad few days fishing, and uh, I'll explain a little bit more once you've, you've had a look at the trailer. There is a wealth of urban fishing over on the continent and when a couple of our Dutch friends, Mikael Pilar and Mark Hoffman, invite Alan and myself down to meet them for a session on a beautiful park lake fishing for giant carp in the heart of Leon, it's decided we are going on a road trip. I was first told about this Park Lake in Leon by, by Mark and McKeel, the two lads here. And uh, we had a few conversations about it, but I can remember vividly one day chatting to them about it. And they told me that to get to the lake, you had to take your barrow in a lift. 
barrow in a lift. Yeah, I was going. It was at that moment I knew I had to go and see this park lake. Um, I spoke to Wynn and Ollie and said, I'm going over, I'm going to do four days fishing, you know, did they want to come and film it? Now, sadly, at the time, Winston was very, very busy putting together the final touches of, our, of one of our tackle DVDs, and he couldn't go, and I know he was gutted. Ollie, however, could, and I never could imagine that when me and Ollie drove out of those gates, you know, of a mountain of SD cards and a load of batteries, that in three months' time, Winston would be able to create such a masterpiece. Um, it just goes to show you, I can sit up here and chat to you guys, but it's not all just me, you know, we are a team, Winston, Ollie and myself, the three of us, those three pieces of the jigsaw coming together is what the end result is. Anyway, I'm going to mention a, a Mike Skinner line here from the streets, you know, there's a bar he drops, it was supposed to be so easy, and there is never a truer word with regards to me and my fishing. I've lost many a good fishing friend over the years due, due to my inability to have the easy life, you know. What could potentially be just, you know, a nice, lovely weekend fishing, when you come with me, turns into a full-blown mission. I don't do anything half-hearted. I've got this uncanny knack of trying to fit in what is physically more than impossible to achieve. And, and along the way, I managed to exhaust not only myself, but the others that are with me. And as a result, yeah, a lot of good friends have said, that's it, I ain't fishing with you ever again, Alan. That's it, enough's enough. Um, and do you know what? This session was to be no different. And I hope I, you know, it hasn't brushed off that badly on you. But it was a mission, weren't it, Rob? It was a mission. Anyway, what could have been four lovely, relaxed days at a park lake in Lyon turned into a full blind mission? First stop, over to Belgium, you know, where we met up with Gio. Um, Gio was really happy to, to see us and he wanted to show us around the local area. We went on a ferry ride. Uh, we stopped off, had some chips and, and some Belgian mayonnaise before dropping onto to a small piece of canal, you know, with a massive salt production factory behind it. The next morning we got up, we didn't catch, we, we went and found them uh, and ended up fishing this amazing harbour location right next to the sea. I caught the most incredible Belgium common. Uh, Gio caught a nice mirror himself. Uh, later on that day, we headed off into Bruges to do a bit more fishing, stopped off, had a beer, got some Belgium chocolates, done a little bit of lure fishing before finally sort of resting in the afternoon sun at another nice urban location. It really was a great day and all in less than 24 hours. It was non-stop. Anyway, we had a big old drive ahead of us, so with a couple of Red Bulls, we headed off down through the south of France to Lyon. We managed to do about eight hours driving that night, sharing the driving, drum and bass cranked right up, but it got to about two o'clock in the morning and we were both shattered, you know, so we decided, you know, the safe thing to do was to be pull over and get a few hours sleep. Now, any normal people would have checked into a B&B, gone and found a little hotel, or as carp anglers, just by the fact that we had bed chairs and stuff in the back, we could have pulled over at a lay-by and got some sleep. Nah, not us. And I blame Ollie as much as this as well, you know. He got on the phone to Nick Elliott, Nick put us on a spot, and we went fishing again. We literally had a couple of hours, probably not even that, sleep that night, and this is where I woke up in the morning. It was worth every minute of it, this beautiful barrage. We didn't catch, but it really did capture the essence of carp fishing to me. Anyway, we had to get on the road again, and it still wasn't quite as simple as going to the park lake, because I'd, I'd arranged to meet up with Pete Wilson and a friend, Johan, who were in Lyon. Now, Johan lives in Lyon. We popped round to his house, had a cappuccino, and then generally a lovely time chatting and stuff. And he put us on this river spot, uh, a part of the river zone. Again, this big barrage, the water was chucking it through, but we had this nice sort of slack eddy on our side, and we decided to drop on there and do a few hours fishing with the chance of catching a carp or two. Well, we didn't manage to catch many carp, but Ollie did manage to catch one small common. We had a ridiculous number of barbel, though. It was proper hectic fishing. We were only there a few hours, and these rods were just ripping off. I remember Ollie was using, like, five tiger nuts on the hair. I was fishing double 20 mil boilies, and these barbel were just snaffling everything. Big fights in a strong current and that. It was a real pucker afternoon's fishing. But all too quickly, the sun started setting, and we had to head off to, to finally get to the hotel, go and have a wash, go and meet up with Pilar and Hoffman, and uh, get ready for a busy day ahead of us when we finally got to fish the park lake. <clears throat> that next morning, waking up was really, really surreal. I got to do what I really wanted. I got to take my barrow in a lift. And after exiting the lift, we went through these buildings and eventually found ourselves at, at the gates to this massive park. Um, it was really surreal. The police come and let us in, the park's controlled by the police, and off we charged through the park to quickly get to the lake to, to, to get on, on a decent area and hopefully catch some fish. Upon arriving, it was still dark, so the lads cracked on and, and got fishing, whereas me and Ollie sort of slowed down a little bit, got our rigs and stuff prepared, waiting for the light to come through so we could see exactly what the crack was. And I tell you, lads, I was not disappointed. It was amazing. It was a beautiful park, this amazing lake bang in the center of it, gin clear waters, massive weed beds, you know, it, it was a real magical place. 
Very, very quickly, I was reassured that there was a decent stock of fish when, when Pilliar and Hoffman were in with a double take. Um, not long after, I managed to get a bite myself uh, and landed a, a sort of upper 20 mirror. And just like every park lake I've ever fished, people come round and got involved, you know. There was this one particular lady, really, really nice. She spoke a little bit of English. She jogs the park every morning and has done for the last sort of 15 years. She'd never actually seen a carp before. And we, and we had this fish on the bank. She'd come over. And I wouldn't even say she was excited. She was ecstatic. Like, she was that happy to see this fish. And it's moments like that that, you know, they mean a lot to me. Um, and I, I wonder one day, you know, the more I do this style of fishing, the more hopefully it might get other people to come into the sport that never actually had the intention of doing it before. Not long after that, Ollie has shot off uh, to get our permits to allow us to actually fish there. And uh, I was gobsmacked when he came back, only to tell me that it was free fishing. You know, we had a pocket full of euros and I had every intention of paying a day ticket or, or whatever they sort of requested, but it was free fishing. It really was incredible. Um, not long after that, I had another take, uh, and this was no ordinary take. It was an absolute melter. It's done about 80 yards of line on the first run, and it's headed off into the corner. Uh, couldn't stop it, couldn't do anything, just picked the rod up and held on for dear life. Almost instantly, I thought to myself, this has got to be a grass carp. There's no way anything could have took off at that sort of speed. And uh, very quickly, my, th that sort of thinking was reassured when the fish come back out into the main body of water, and we could see this huge black shape just underneath the surface. There was very little I could do other than hold on and wait to see its next move. Uh, and that next move was sadly a big shake of his head and my little choddy falling out. Later on I found out there is a few grass carp in the lake, only a small number, but all of those fish are around 30 kilos in weight, so around 70 pounds, yeah. You win some, you lose some, eh? but that's part and parcel of fishing. The afternoon wore on and the fishing was a little bit slow for me, me and Ollie. Pilliar and Hoffman, who were a bit further down the bank, they had this big island out in front of them and they were fishing right underneath the canopy of the island. And I think, again, just like all park lakes I've fished, in the daytime those fish are looking for sanctuary and in the case of this particular lake, they were just swimming around this island, living underneath the trees. So me and Ollie decided we'd head round the other side and try and attack this island from a different angle. Off we went on a mission. We see this massive tunnel going underneath the lake that took you onto one of the islands, so I had to check that out. Carried on walking a bit further around, come to a restaurant, had some steak and chips for lunch, and, and it was right on the water's edge, and we were sitting there having lunch. There's all these massive roach, hybrid, rudd, etc. Loads of bream, even some carp and that, and we're feeding these fish. It was really incredible. I literally had to sit on my hands to stop myself going to my barrow, getting a rod and catching one in, in the middle of this restaurant, but I did manage to refrain. We then carried on walking only to find a zoo. I'm, I kid you not, there was a zoo and it was free to get in. Not only a zoo, there was a theme park. I've done it, I've gone in with my barrow. I've walked the whole way around this zoo, lions, giraffes, bears, alligators, crocodiles. I kid you not, the French were looking at me like I was some sort of exhibit. They were like, what is this geezer doing barrowing a load of fishing gear around the zoo? But I did it and I loved it. It was great. Got out the other side and I was back at the lake again and uh, I got some rods out, but that was easier said than done. The lake had a number of pedalos on it. You could hire these pedalos for an hour or even a day if you wished, and they were everywhere, zigzagging all over the place. The aim of the game was for me to get a baited rig about 200 yards in a bait boat to an island, but it was an absolute mission. I'd get about 150 yards out and a pedal, I'd come across, I'd have to stop, wait, and it was stop, start, stop, start, trying to get this bait boat out onto to this island. And, and worse than that, if, if the bait boat got anywhere near one of these pedalos, the French would go up to it, they're trying to pick my bait boat up, having a good look at it. It, was just, it took me about an hour and a half to get one rod out. I eventually got one rod out, and frankly speaking, I was dreading trying to get the second rod out there. Well, I didn't need to worry, because the first rod ripped off. It had only been in the water sort of 10, 15 minutes. The end result was this puck of fish. I had to coax it back about 200 yards, and this crowd just grew behind me, 10 people, 20 people, 30. There's about 100 people gathered around when I was playing this fish. It was an incredible special moment. I got it in the net, and nudging under 40 pounds. You know, carp fishing's great, but to share a moment like this with so many other people that were also so happy that I'd caught the fish, it really did make it make it an amazing day and before I knew it the day had come to a close uh, we were back at the hotel getting our heads down ready for another early start the next morning the next morning you know the weather was dreadful we were due to stay all day but as a result of a torrential downpour we decided to cut it short and disappear about midday um, that said I did sneak into the park during the night when you're not meant to be there and I absolutely filled it in with amber strawberry every single boiler I had bar enough few enough hook baits for the next day's fishing went in the lake and the fish got right on the munch the end result was very quickly I caught four nice fish Ollie managed to bag a couple himself and we had a right good hit just before leaving 
Um, yeah, that was Eurobanks, guys. Uh, you can be sure that won't be the, the last Eurobanks episode that will appear on YouTube o over the next few months and years. And I suppose that's drawn me to a close. Rob's saying I've got to get off now. Just before I finish, guys, um, you know, I hope but that by showing you this sort of fishing and this style of fishing, it, it makes you realise that that take me out clip at the start isn't that applicable. Fishing isn't boring. It fishing's what you you want to make it to be. You know, fishing's cool. It is current. It's modern, and it's here for the future. And I hope by going out and fishing in these sort of accessible places, it not only maybe gets potential new people into the sport, but maybe existing anglers also realise that it isn't always the be all and end all. Going out there catching the largest name fish they can, and that sometimes fishing can be simply just about going out, having fun, bit of excitement, and a lovely time with your mate. I'm going to wrap up now, Rob. Thank you very much. Ollie, thank you. Winston, thank you. Thank you all very much, guys. All the best. Bye-bye. There you go, guys. Well, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I must say uh, that if you were a magazine feature, you would have a word count of about 350 million. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How you managed to get so much into such a short period of time, but it just goes to show, once again, as he says, fishing is fun. Some of the shows we have are educational, that is educational, and from my point of view, that is inspirational as well. Well done, Alan. Thanks, guys. Have a lovely weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.